All right, it is three o'clock and we are going to begin with the program. Thank you to everyone for joining us. My name is Jane Cherry from the Cooperative and Policy Alternative Centre and we are a partner of the South African Food Sovereignty Campaign and together we are bringing you this workshop which is one of four of a series of how to start your own food garden. Before I hand over to John, I'm just going to give you a brief introduction to the series and then share the program and some housekeeping. So just to be brief, the series is broken up into four themes. Today we look at setting up your household garden with an introduction to food sovereignty and agroecology. Next week we're going to look at what to plant, when, where and how and based on needs and nutrition. And the workshop will also discuss the theory of food sovereignty. The third week we look at indigenous, indigenous knowledge, food commons and, sorry, um, and in indigenous foods. And then the fourth week looks at observing and maintaining your food garden for best results with a little bit of theory on agroecology practice in South Africa. And our hope is that by the end of these four weeks, you'll be ready and equipped to prepare to plant and maintain your household or community food garden to feed yourselves and your communities, but also to share what you have learned with others to strengthen food sovereignty pathways in South Africa. And then just to mention that this is only phase one of the three phases in the education program we have planned. The other phases look at deepening um, a food sovereignty approach, theory and practical elements. And so in phase two, we'll look at topics like water harvesting, composting, um, waste, and all of that, waste management. So be sure to stay with us. I'm just going to share my screen again. Um, and I'm going to go over the housekeeping rules with you. So firstly, please use your chat. Um, we don't have time um, to give everyone an opportunity to speak. So please write a comment. If you have any questions during the, during the workshop, please write them. We'll be looking at them and answering them at the end of this workshop. We're streaming live, live on Facebook, so if you get cooked out, kicked out for any reason and you can't rejoin, please join us on Facebook. We're recording all the workshops and we'll share this with everyone in the next day or so, everyone who has registered, but also on our Facebook page, we'll share it there. Do your homework. Um, so the outcome of these workshops is that you have a, a wonderful garden producing food for you, so it would help if you could do your homework and be going step by step. So this week, um, prepare your land so that next week you can go ahead and plant your plants. Um, we're working on setting up an agroecology agro advice panel. So if you ever have any questions, we're going to have a, a number of people with their numbers who you can contact, um, for example, on WhatsApp and get answers hopefully right away. And then lastly, just remember um, COVID safety guidelines. So we are doing this in the, the context of the pandemic. We have developed a number of tools and Courtney will um, post the, the link which I've got here uh, into the chat so you can just copy that and look at these tools um, and then this is just a sneak peek of what they are. These are safety guidelines for food growers so please remember to follow these in your household garden and on your farm. Okay, um, I'm going to stop sharing quickly. Now I'm going to get right into the presentation. I'm just going to have a look at the chats to see if there's anything. Okay. No one is chatting in the background. Um, all right. So this is a workshop which we are redoing because on Wednesday we had some sound issues, which means that we have recorded John's input, which I will play for you now and then please put comments and questions in the chat. And John is with us in person, and so he will still be able to respond afterwards. So I'm going to share my screen again and play the recording. Okay. Okay, thank you. 
Um, today we are going to talk about uh, how to set a permaculture garden at household level and also in urban areas. To set a permaculture garden, uh, we follow certain principles and we follow certain theories and uh, methodologies like permaculture as a design system uh, and also the application of uh, agroecology principles to create regenerative systems for food sovereignty. Within these systems and approaches, we have ethics that we follow. And these ethics are care of the people, care of their earth, and share with people the, and the earth. When we say care of the people, it's all about decolonizing ourselves. By decolonizing is that we are not going to be colonized by the industrial agriculture systems where we depend from them from all agricultural inputs, from all the seeds that we use. It is all about taking responsibility of our families and the future generation, that they should be independent and sovereign in whatever they want to use or grow and own on the land. Being independent, it means that you own at least you own a piece of land. Because without a piece of land, you might not be able to do what you want. You might not have the choice or the right to select the right crop or to grow the crops that you will require. So in this approach, there is independence that we try to create, that you should have your own seeds, you should have land, you should have a choice of selecting the plants you want. Even the garden is small, or the land is as large as one, uh, 10 hectares, the most important thing is to be independent as a person and to select the choices, the plants you require to grow in your, in your farm, on your farm. With this, as you grow your food, you have to be, to care, take care of the environment or to understand the environment. By understanding the environment, it's, do you understand the water cycles? Do you understand the energy cycles? Do you understand the management of soils and the plants that are around us? The air, the movement of uh, the movement uh, of of the sun, the all these they need to be considered when you are developing your garden. For example, when we talk of uh, the uh, the water, do we have? water management system on your farm or your place. Where does the water go after a rain? Usually you see water follows the pathway that goes to your homestead and takes water away from your, your farm to the, to the ocean, to the rivers, then ocean. Then that process, we should stop it. It is us we have to stop because you, have created, you are creating independence around you and around the family. So we are the right people to stop the challenges that we found on the environment. Environment, if we take care of the environment, it will take care of us. So this is the message that we need to know. Even when you are doing a small garden, the environment should be uh, taken care of. Most, mostly the water, the soil, uh, and the plants that are, grow, that are in the area. The animals, some of the animals that are small microorganisms that are in the soil, they need to be taken care of. When you are now able to grow your food, you are able to, to take care of the environment, the access, the profits or the surplus need to be shared back to the community. What is it, what we are talking about? We are talking about whatever knowledge you have, whatever the food you produce, give it out to the younger generation, to the children, educate the knowledge we have, educate young people so that they take the message further and the seeds that we actually produce, we need to save them so that you plow them back into nature and nature will benefit from the seeds that you plow back or the trees that you plant back in the system. 
all organic matter should not be burned. It should be returned back into nature so that the nature will take care of us. Next slide. Sorry, John, it's just stuck. I'm just trying to fix it. Oh, okay. Yeah. It is important that when we are working, planning to develop your garden, there are the considerations that we need to do. Uh, the first thing you need to do is to take a walk in the field. Taking a walk, it means you are assessing what is on the ground. You are assessing and observing the sun aspect, the wind direction, the slopes of the land, water, uh, run off and record all the existing elements within your, your garden or your farm. The next step is to develop a map. Draw a map that tells you what is the situation now. And then you refer this map all the time when you develop your farm. And you then develop a map of the future. What do you want to see in the future? And that will be guiding you in developing your, your farm. Assess types of plants. We have different plants, good and bad plants, in our farms or wherever we are. But it is important that, and it is a paramount that you need to know plants. Which plants are good for you? Which plants are indigenous? Which plants are invasive? Which plants are exotic? How can you integrate them in the system of permaculture? How can you integrate them in the system of farming? Uh, like you see where I am right now, my garden, lots of plants, there are over uh, uh, 42 uh, species in a small garden, uh, about 10 square meters, 42 varieties of plants. But the most important thing is to know which plant can you bring home, which plant can you remove, which plant can be planted uh, on the fence, on the boundary, which plant can be planted uh, closer to the river, closer to the building. Those things you need to understand and follow the system of analyzing plants. Then you will need to know the water source. Where is going to be the water for your, coming from for your garden? Is it a municipality water? If it is a municipality water, the challenge is it means you create dependence where you pay uh, all the time to municipality. But the most important thing is to harvest water, catch water from the roof, put in your tank, and then use it whenever you need to irrigate your garden. Or if you drill a ball, make sure that the runoff water is channeled in a way that it infiltrates into the soil. When it infiltrates into the soil, it uh, it, it, it helps in uh, bringing up the water table and support your, your bowl. As you deal with your farm, you need to understand that uh, there are soils. The land is important. The land, you need to understand what type of soil you have. For example, you can have this soil like this. That is the soil that we found here on the farm. And you need to understand uh, alkaline soil or acidic soil by indicators that you find on the farm. There are plants that are like oxalis grows, oxalis plant grows in acidic soils. Dandelion, it grows in acidic soils. So you need to know which plants grows in acidic soil, which plants grows in alkaline soil. And when you see these plants growing there, it means the soil is acidic. So you need to work out how you can develop that. So the bottom line, what we are talking about here is, these are the assessments that you do to develop your garden. 
So let's go step by step and see how we can develop a garden. Next slide. So what we talk about is we have learned, like this example of uh, a rural community uh, in, in Limpopo, this is a household, and with this household, the, uh, the land there is a desert. And the main people may refer deserts in Karari or in uh, Sahara, uh, but deserts are right in front of our doorstep. And how do you deal with this situation? The soil is sandy, as you see, and very poor. And in some areas you find sand very clay. In some area you find sand very much eroded. The topsoil is gone. It has been deposited to ocean. How can we then develop that? This is, these are the steps that I'm going to show you today, that you can change any type of soil using permaculture systems. Any type of soil can be changed by simple methods very simple method and the method that i'm going to share with you are simple and you can apply it anywhere you can grow food anywhere you go and uh, as long you have soil manure or compost as long you have the the containers or land or uh, a place where you can have access to grow food next slide So basically, when we are talking of uh, methods of uh, creating health soil, we need to consider uh, elements like ground uh, cover, ground. Uh, ground cover, uh, it's important. Where all the time, when we are dealing with the farming, you need to see that the ground is covered in two forms. In dry matter, like as you see in my garden, I'm sitting in my garden, we have the the dry matter, this here it is. That is covering all my garden. The soil, you can hardly see the soil because this is the blanket of, this is the blanket of the soil. And once you have this blanket, it means microorganisms are gonna operate or work underneath and they will help the soil to be rich. A rich soil, then it helps the plants to grow happily and strong and produce health, health food. It is important also if you do not have dry grass, like in, if you are in rural area, you can plant what we call the uh, green manure cover crops. And green manure cover crops are plants like uh, dolichos lab lab or uh, velvet bean, mukuna, or cow peas. Because these plants, they are nitrogen fixing plants. They creep and they cover the ground. When they cover the ground, they it releases nitrogen through the roots and also through the leaves when the leaves are dropping down. And the example that I can give you is the plant behind me. This one is a Dolco slab lab. And also here I planted it with lima bean. So you can have lima bean as a ground cover instead of staking it up with a, it can be a, a left on the ground to run, to cover the ground. And then at the end of the day, it produces good nit nitrogen, good minerals for the plants to grow healthy. It is important also to consider uh, making own biofertilizers. By making own biofertilizers, we are saying Bokashi can be prepared to, to, make, uh, to make good soil. For example, you can collect all organic, uh, organic matter in our farm and put it together and add manmo manure, add wood ash, add and make a pile of different uh, organic matter and add water, it decompose. And there are different methods you can do to make uh, bokashi. You can make compost. Many of you, you know how to make compost. I think one day I'm going to teach about making compost or making bokashi. 
but he compost is also a mixture of organic matter and more manure, uh, grass, like organic matter like grass, um, dry, uh, leaves, or um, uh, wood ash, or um, animal manure. You put it together, you add the uh, water, it decompose for maybe after a month, or after one month and a half, then it gives you manure for the farm. You can also apply liquid manure. Liquid manure is when you take fresh manure, animal manure, you ferment it and then produce liquid, then you use it in your garden. Or you can use uh, green weeds, like weeds in the garden. Collect weeds or high uh, nitrogen plants uh, that just grow in the garden, like uh, chickweed, like amaranthus. You put them in a bag and then you, you soak them in water. They produce the water, uh, the liquid, and that liquid can be used in the garden. We can also use uh, vermiculture. When we say vermiculture, we are talking of earthworms. And the earthworms, here I have an earthworm farm, all the kitchen waste that I have, it goes into the, into the ground, into, into the earthworms. And after, after a certain period, the earthworms, for example, you see the soil. So it's a great, good soil and lots of earthworms. And if I take this and apply into the field to my plants, then the plants will get food because the earthworms are making the uh, excellent food, what we call earthworm carcass, uh, cast. And earthworm cast, it helps in the uh, providing all the nutrients that are required by, by the plants. And then at the end of the day, the plants are growing happily and uh, healthy. The other method we can do is to practice what we call the uh, zero tillaging. And the zero tillaging or sheet mulching, it's a method that uh, helps in improving the soil. For example, the sheet mulching, it's a method that is very easy. You, you can say, for example, you have grass, lots of grass in your garden. And when you have grass like this, uh, you cut on the edge and then you apply a manure on top, you apply manure, and then you cover the manure with cut boxes or newspaper. So you cover manure and you cover the grass with a newspaper and make sure on the edge the grass is not growing, you, you put a bounder and you sprinkle again, can be almond manure or compost or earthworm farm, earthworm uh, cast or earthworm compost, you put on top again to cover the cut box. And after that, you put dry grass mulch to cover. And when you cover like this, you put then water. You water to make sure that everything is decomposing. So the card box that we put below, it's, uh, it's helping to kill the grass. The grass is not going to get uh, sunlight for it to grow. So the cut box is suppressing the grass and the grass is going to decompose. It's going to die. When it decomposes, it becomes manure as well. The cut box is high in carbon. Because it's high in carbon, the earthworm farm is high in nitrogen. So we mix the two to make the cut box decompose. If you put the cut box alone without a, without Animal manure or earthworm manure or earthworm uh, cast, the cut box will take a long time to decompose. Or even the newspaper, it will take a longer time to decompose because it's high in carbon. That's why we put a layer of material that is high in nitrogen and material that is high in, 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 in carbon. We put it together 
we put water and then it decompose when it decompose then the grass that is below also dies and then after some uh, two weeks or so or uh, maybe a month you come and drill a hole and then you plant your crop in there you drill a hole you plant the crops in there we are, we are going to talk about how to plant uh, crops in the next uh, say, say, uh, next uh, lessons you can also practice what we call early cropping to improve the soil and uh, make intercropping mixed farming this is where even you see in my farm I have, I say I have 42 varieties of plants here. It's not just for decoration, but they are planted accordingly to the relationship of the plants to help improving the soil. Some helping in controlling pests. For example, we have this plant called uh, uh, broad bean. Broad bean is a nitrogen fixing plant. So if you plant it with the example of uh, uh, spinach, then you cut this one, it fixes nitrogen, the, uh, the broad bean, but at the same time you can cut it back and use it as mulch in the garden. And when it becomes mulch, it decomposes faster. And then it provides you with the, the nutrients that are required by spinach. Or you can plant what you call sun hemp in line with your spinach or in line with your uh, uh, summer crops. And the sun hemp, before it flowers, you cut it back, you mulch under maybe uh, its maize, underneath maize. They decompose fast and they can release nutrients back into the soil. Remember, these plants that are green manure, uh, are that, that are good for early cropping or intercropping, they are nitrogen fixing plants. They are legumes. They are good in doing, in applying back the nutrients into the soil. The other method that we can do is make a trench bed. And a trench bed is simple. You dig, for example, 15 uh, centimeter deep. Depends where you are. If it's sand soil, it's 15 centimeter, it's okay. But if it's clay soil, you can go for 20 or uh, 40 centimeter deep. And with it can be about uh, five, it can be about 10 to 20 centimeter wide. And then uh, the length is determined by uh, the size of bed you want to do. You put your organic matter there, wood ash, uh, eggshells, egg, egg uh, bones, um, leaves, uh, kitchen cuttings, you add it into there and in layers. And then you close, you shape your bed. And then you plant on top after one month. And the plant's roots will go deeper into that. And then the plant will grow very well. This is a good system for tomatoes. It's a good system for spinach. It's a good system for uh, plants that are heavy, heavy feeders. I'll show you the next slide that plants that are heavy feeders. Then you can do pit beds. It's a pit bed, it can be smaller or uh, large. For example, the big one that I can encourage people to do, it's one meter by one meter by one meter. The one meter, you use a spade to measure that. Then you, you dig another one meter down and then you, the, then you put layers of uh, different organic matter. The harder organic matter at the bottom. For example, uh, logs, twigs, it goes right at the bottom. Tins, uh, tins are good because they release uh, iron into the soil. Then you put bones, they take time to decompose in the bottom layer. Then you put cut boxes, you put compost, and then you start putting layers of uh, compost and grass, compost and grass until to the top. And then you close and shape your bed, and then when when done when you are done about uh, shaping your bed then you plant a uh, pumpkin and pumpkin they like that environment because you have deposited a bank it's, you have created a bank of uh, nutrients where the uh, pumpkin 
or any heavy feeder can send roots into that pit bed and continuously uh, receive the nutrients that are required uh, for the plant to grow. Then the plant can grow uh, healthy, happily, and uh, can produce enough fruit or sizable fruit that you require for your family. So it is important that you decide what you want to do in your garden. The other methods that we can do is to create uh, crates like this one. Simple, it's four pieces of uh, plants and the size is determined by what you want to grow. It can be this size, 30 centimeter by uh, 50 centimeters and you put it right in the garden or closer to your to your house and then you put manure or compost can be good soil that you can use like this one good soil like this soil you put it and then in uh, almost half full after that you sprinkle earthworms on top and you cover with mulch you cover with grass cover with the grass and then it's ready for planting the method why we do not have the bottom uh, layer covered is because you're allowing the roots to go deeper into the soil. But this one, it's a border of your garden. It's like a raised bed. And a raised bed can be of this size or any size you want, or you can use, you can use a rake. For example, a rake, a rake, Sorry, John. The rake is 1.2. I recommend people to use 1.2 width of a bed. Because if you're a husband and wife, or the husband is this side and the wife is the other side. And then when you, you are chatting, but at the same time planting uh, vegetables, your hands can reach at the center. You are able to reach. Your husband is there. Uh, you, you are working from this side or my wife is there, I'm working from this side. I can be able to, to plant and chat with my wife and continue going two lines. I'm planting two lines. My wife is planting two, two lines. And then we continue that way. And the length of the bed can be in size. It can be uh, from one meter, two meters, three meters, even 10 meters. It depends what size of land you have. So it's also the method of a raised bed. The other method that you can do is the, this container where you look off planks and you, you take planks like this and put a base and you put a plastic inside so that it holds water and also it holds the, the soil. You put the same layer, you put rich soil here either from compost or a good soil, or a mixture of one is to one, one compost, one soil, ordinary topsoil in your, from your garden, and you put in layer. Do not make it full, make it three quarter full. And then after that, you put, you sprinkle earthworms. After that, you put a layer of uh, grass on top, and then you wait for planting. This, you can do it and you can plant the same day, or you can plant after two days just to wait the soil to settle a little bit. The choice is yours of what you want to plant in, in the container. There are other, other containers that you can use. You can use this container. And the container, it has some holes at the bottom. And the, why we have holes is that you are allowing the water to pass through and you put a, a layer of uh, grass on the bottom, uh, you put a layer of uh, good soil 
topsoil and compost on top, and then you put mulch, and then it's prepared and ready for planting. This container size, it's good for planting uh, things like carrots, because the roots can go deeper, because this is a 20 liter uh, size uh, bucket. So you can plant carrots, you can plant spinach in the same container. Next slide. Okay. Okay, on this slide, we, we are explaining how you can prepare the soil from bad soil to the good soil. For example, you can see at the top on the left side, behind this lady who is measuring the wreck. Uh, the, this is how they have been planting vegetables. You can see that uh, the spacing is too wide. The land is not covered. These guys have been using synthetic chemicals. The land was not designed properly. Uh, water was running away from the area. So when we came to the place, to the project, we assist them in designing the land. And you can see that is in a condor line where we are catching water into that drain, uh, ditch. And we are shaping and measuring our bed with 1.2 meter wide. And after uh, three months to your right, you see the garden looks wonderful. And the, the pathways is mulched. The garden now is intensively planted and there is a lot of uh, food in a small piece of land. And like this. Next slide. We, we are saying when you are deciding to plant or preparing the soil, your soil can come from this hard soil like this one, very hard soil, uh, to good soil like this one. This is what we call good soil. Good soil from <coughs> It has lots of organic matter and it's blackish, it's good soil, it's humus. It has lots of humus and uh, it's a loam soil. Also, you can change this one. You see, this is a terrible soil. It's not good soil. Uh, it's very poor in the organic content. So you grow crops the year, they struggle to grow because of the conditions that we have. The soil is clay or even if it's sand, there is no nutrients for a plant to grow. So when you are deciding to prepare for this type of um, uh, methods of preparing uh, soil to grow your crops, you need to consider plants like heavy feeders, tomatoes, cabbages, spinach, uh, pumpkins, butternut, potatoes, sweet potatoes, maize, mustard, kale, uh, and others. These, they need food. They are hay feeders. So it is good to plant them in a trench bed. So if you plant them in a trench bed, it helps them to get the food they want. Uh, because a trench bed is a bank of uh, food or nutrients for the plants. So if you are doing a standard bed, you need to apply a good manure, like you cover the topsoil with the, about a three to five centimeter thick or layer of compost. And then you mix the compost with soil. After that, you mulch. And after mulching, you plant these crops that I've mentioned uh, earlier, tomatoes, uh, cabbages, spinach, and others. There are a group of light feeders like onion, 
leeks, garlic, carrots, beetroot, uh, lettuce. These are not heavy feeder. They don't like a lot of uh, manure, so or a lot of uh, compost or nitrogen. Uh, they are they can grow in a very light uh, uh, soil type. For example, if you are doing standard beta as well, instead of putting uh, compost for about five centimeter, five centimeter, you put only about two centimeter layer of uh, manure or compost, and then you mix the soil with the, uh, the compost. After mixing, then you put mulch, a little bit of mulch. Again, these plants, they don't need thick mulch. They don't need deep mulch. They need slight mulch to cover a little bit of that. You can see soil a little bit on through the, the mulch. And uh, the plants can grow uh, well in that environment. We have what we call heavy givers. The heavy givers, most of them, they do not need rich soil. You use just uh, topsoil that we have in your area. If the soil is bad like this one, or like what you see here, you can sprinkle a little bit of manure to boost them to grow. The legumes are those plants that, that give a, a, a lot of nitrogen or nutrients back into the soil. And they include beans, peas, a uh, wide variety of beans, and peas, uh, <coughs> lab lab species, lima beans, all these plants that fix nitrogen, they are good uh, to grow and you don't need uh, rich soil to grow them. In a sense, soil can grow them, but sprinkle a little bit of manure just to boost them, the germination and the growth in the first stage. Then you, you, are, you, you let's say you want to grow herbaceous plants. Herbaceous plants are parsley, strawberry, celery, coriander, turmeric, thyme, rosemary, oregano. When you are growing these, they don't need also a lot of manure. You can do uh, the same method like the way we prepare for light feeders. They grow easy with the low uh, nutrient uh, condensed soil. So it is important that when you are growing them, do not put too much water, too much uh, 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 manure or compost, because some of them they even die if it's too much of uh, manure in them. Um, then you need to consider fruit trees, nuts, berries. This includes the citrus, uh, the subtropical plants, fruits like uh, the mango, avocado, tree tomatoes. Uh, and also the palm fruits, palm fruits we are talking of, the uh, apples and uh, the stone fruits we are talking about, the peach, uh, the plums, the apricot, and uh, we are talking of nuts, trees, like pecan nut, the macadamia nut, uh, walnuts, and also talk of the figs and the berries. Uh, all these plants, they need rich soil. Now you can prepare uh, them for a pit bed, which is one meter by one meter by one meter deep. If the soil is too hard, you can reduce the measurement to uh, 50 by 50 by 50. And then you put layers of organic matter, the hard stuff at the bottom and soft stuff as you go, fill up the, the, uh, the pit. And you need to prepare this in winter and then you plant in summer. The reason is that uh, you need this organic matter to decompose and when you reach uh, summer, they are well decomposed. And then you put your, you plant your tree, then with the rains, you trap the water to go to the tree and with the rains, the tree grow happily and produce the good fruits for you, the health fruits for the family. But with berries, you can plant them anytime. Sometimes if you are uh, growing the current berries, 
the blue bellies, they are they don't need as big uh, pits like the uh, nut tree or the subtropical trees. It should be a little bit smaller, and that helps them to grow enough to produce enough nice berries. We also need to consider the vines, grapes, kiwi fruits, passion fruits. Passion fruits are the uh, the granadillas, the shushus, and all these. They are easy to grow plants, but they need to be fed with good nutrients. For example, the, uh, the grapes, they will need uh, small pits like 30 centimeter by 30 centimeter, and then you feed it with organic matter, and then you plant. It grow happily. But the shushu, and the, uh, especially the shushu, do not need lots of organic matter. It needs minimum organic matter, uh, like you can make the pit smaller, uh, like the berry type size of a, of a, a, a pit. So basically, that's how you can grow these plants. And it's important to know these plants. And it's how you can prepare uh, the soils for this type of plants. Next slide. Here we are saying for us to continue producing uh, crops, health crops, health plants, like the plants you see in my garden, uh, it is important that you promote ground cover all the time. Cover the ground. The ground should not be left naked. The ground should be covered with a blanket of grass, of mulch. The mulch is very important. And the green manure is very important. This will help to improve the fertility and the health of the soil. Absorption of water, make sure that uh, there is no runoff water on the surface away from your farm or your place. Make sure the water infiltrates into the soil. In your garden, after rain, you don't need to see water stagnating. When water is stagnating, it means the soil is compacted. So if the soil is loose, it's, it's loose and with a lot of organic matter, the water goes into the ground and it infiltrates and supports the plants and other microorganisms in there. Protect and preserve soil. It is important that never allow soil erosion from your garden, from your place. And soil erosion, it's instigated or it's, uh, it, it follows the water. After rain, water runs on the surface and then it takes the topsoil away. And in Africa, we are losing tons and tons, metric tons of soil every year to the ocean. And this topsoil to the ocean, we cannot return it back into our homesteads or into our farms. So it is important and it is your responsibility to make sure that we don't allow any uh, amount or grams of soil to run away from your farm. That's in combination of water. Never allow a water soil to run away from your farm. It is your responsibility to make sure that in, uh, the, the nature is conserved through that means. Feeding the soil, uh, not the plant. It is a principle that is very important that if you start feeding the soil, that's where you think of buying synthetic chemicals and you put on the plant. It is a system of uh, uh, colonizing the plant. If you, plan, if you want a plant to be free, to have a good freedom, you feed the soil and plant your crop in the well-prepared soil and continue mulching, continue feeding the soil, focusing mainly on the soil. And once you focus on the soil, the microorganisms and the, the chemistry within the soil, it will help any plant to grow. The only uh, thing that we need just to be careful of is certain plants like carrots cannot grow in a very rich soil. It will start making branches or make lots of leaves without giving you the root that we require. So it is important that we make sure that our soils are rich by making biofertilizers, uh, green manure cover crops, 
to make sure that the soil is always having food for the plants. The next principle that we encourage people to practice is pollution, no pollution, stop pollution. When you say stop pollution, say no or refuse to bring in uh, synthetic chemicals. Try by all means to or make organic fertilizer, make uh, biofertilizer for the plants. Try by all means to practice the uh, biological pest control or botanical pest control, natural pest control. Encourage predators in the garden so that you don't bring chemicals in the soil or chemicals in the farm. The more you bring chemicals in the proper in the garden, you are not killing only the the pesticides or the uh, the aphids or the insects that are in the garden. You are killing other beneficial insects, and you are also killing yourself indirectly because at the end of the day, you eat these plants that has chemicals, and then uh, you develop a uh, cancer. You develop. Yeah, diseases that are not known or not traced. We cannot trust where they are coming from, uh, where the disease is coming from. But at the end of the day, you find out that it's coming from the chemicals that we are using. Remember, most of the chemicals that we are using, they came from the Second World War and through the Green Revolution system. And that, they failed to dump them away or to destroy them, but they dump them, especially in Africa. And we are using these chemicals to control pests in our garden, to, con to, to feed our plants. And at the end of the day, you are uh, colonizing yourself and you are destroying yourself. So to protect yourself, stop using pesticides, stop using synthetic chemicals and focus on organic farming, organic inputs. That will address the sovereignty or independence of what you want to see in your community. And that will bring our cultural systems into play. That will bring our indigenous practices into play. Into play. And at the same time, that will save money. Uh, will save money and you'll be independent in terms of uh, economical basis. Next slide. So once you feed your soil, once your soil is good, you are happy to grow plants like uh, this. You see, this is my, my former garden, and uh, I used to produce whatever I want in my former garden, my old garden. And this looks like this because I feed the soil. The plants, any plant you want to grow, it can grow happily. And you have happy children, they enjoy planting or working in the garden because there is no pollution in the garden. And if you have pollution, if you are spraying, then at the end of the day you say, uh, 14 days, no one to go in the garden because we've just sprayed. So you, you see it's not independent. You are not free, you are suppressed. So the answer to the future and future generation is to grow your plants in an organic way or in a natural way uh, using agroecological systems and principles that will help us to change our lives. Next slide. And together we can make a great place to live. That is, if we practice agroecological systems and we create, that will create sovereignty for our people and that will create independence for the future generation and freedom to make a choice of whatever they want to grow. And hence, the environment will take care of us. And this is important that let's spread the gospel to other people. Let's teach other, our children, let's teach other people about uh, agroecological principles, permaculture design systems, and regenerative systems to make sure that uh, we live happily with the environment. I thank you. Right, thank you so much, John.
Um, I see there's a number of comments in the chat. John, if you could turn on your mic and your camera. Thanks. So John, you've probably been looking at some of these comments. Um, I'm sure we won't be able to respond to all of them now because we are pressed for time, but if you want to respond to a few of them, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Thank you everybody for following the, the discussion. Uh, basically from the questions that I have been gathering, some of the questions, um, and some of the questions have been answered as we go through. I want to start with the, the Kirsten's question about uh, the plant that starts with a D, Dolicos Lab Lab. I think somebody has answered that. It's a bean that is indigenous to Africa. It is our African plant, but uh, it has been pushed away from the systems and uh, we were educated to, to grow the uh, other types of beans. So it is important that we bring uh, this type of bean back, Dorcos Lab Lab. It's uh, indigenous to us and we can uh, grow it easily. It's a good ground cover and good food, good nitrogen fixing. You eat the leaves, the flower, you eat also the, the pod and it's uh, yeah, a multi-purpose plant. Uh, there is somebody who asked about a pit bed. If you can use it uh, annual, annually, or you you continue uh, uh, growing, uh, I mean maintaining it. It is important that if you use tins and uh, bones into the into the soil, it is not important to remove the manure from that that type of pit bed. It is important just you continue adding organic matter, adding earthworms, adding um, all things that can decompose, and then you continue planting on the sides. And when you continue planting on the side, the plants send their roots into the into the pit bed, and then it, they they survive easily on that. And the whole idea is to make a compost that you are not shifting. It's a permanent compost that is feeding the plants that are around. And uh, the other question that I picked was the. Uh, about the acidic soil again, um, the acidic soil or alkaline soil. You can collect soil and test with a litmus paper. The litmus paper, you can get it uh, from, uh, uh, you can get it from, the litmus paper, you can get it from uh, a chemistry a shop. And then uh, you can dip the litmus paper into the water. And uh, when you dip it into the water, it shows like uh, how they test it. Uh, uh, urine. When you go to the clinic, you know, they take urine and then they put deep a litmus paper and measure, then it indicates the acidic of the soil. But the most important thing is that when you dig the soil and there is no, uh, there is no earthworm in the soil, what it means is that uh, the soil is either alkalinity or acidic. Earthworms cannot live with the pH that is minus five or uh, that is yeah, minus five or uh, that is five, four, three down, or they live around six uh, pH uh, or six point or seven. Then uh, lime can be used, the agricultural lime. It's called dolerite lime. And the dolerite lime, uh, you can actually buy it from shops and uh, you can apply it. But to balance that pH, continue applying organic matter, the compost, and earthworms. The earthworms duty is to balance the pH scale. Once you have earthworms, then you know your pH is good for most of the plants that you need to grow. Uh, yes, which means no earthworms, it's, uh, it means the soil is poor, it's not good. Um, yes, about soil. The soil, um, I didn't go a little deeper on that. The soil have classes or types of soil, the, uh, there is clay soil, there is a sand loam soil or loam soil, there is silt, there is gravel so soil, there is sand soil. All these soils, they are existing in our farms, but all what we need in our farm is to have one type of soil, loam soil. Like right now, in front of me, I can just take the soil from my garden, you see? If you check it, this is from my garden. And you can see earthworms and ants, they are eating earthworms. It's very, very good soil. 
And this is all what you need to create in your garden. So uh, you create this by adding the blanket all the time, adding the blanket of the soil, which is the mulch or you your green mulch. And then it balances all what you need in your garden or in, on your farm. Um, uh, where should we get shushu? Like somebody asked, where should we get shushu? Shushu is a plant that creeps and uh, uh, maybe some nesters do have. Um, I do, I'm, I'm starting multiplying it. Uh, maybe by end of uh, the, this year, I will have lots of uh, shushu, shushu plants, um, but mostly in the nesters. Um, and uh, some of the questions I missed them, but basically, uh, the, 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 the idea behind is that to make sure that you prepare good soil for your plants and the design around uh, your vegetable bed is determined by what you observe around you and what elements can influence to design a certain uh, shape of, the, uh, of, a bad, uh, of a garden. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you so much, John. And there's a lot more com comments coming in, just saying how useful um, and how grateful people are for this workshop. So thank you, John. Um, and yeah, it looks like we've ended on time. So just to say, I know there's a number of comments and questions about the recordings. Yes, we will send you the recordings as soon as they're up on YouTube. But if you can't wait, it's also, as soon as we end this, um, it will be available on Facebook because we are streaming live to Facebook. And then just to mention, our next workshop will take place on Wednesday, the next week, Wednesday, the 22nd of July, where John will be sharing with us what to plant in your garden. So there we will address um, companion planting, crop rotation and all of that. I see that there have been some questions about that. Courtney will post in the chat um, the link to sign up and we will send out emails to everyone who's participated on, in the webinar uh, with that link. We'll also put it on social media very shortly. Um, and yes, thank you very much, John. Um, and everyone, please go out and find some worms um, and prepare your soil for our next workshop. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Take care. You too, John. Thank you.